This short clip is presented by Edge. Edge is our pro-to-pro -pro advisory service, which is all about the macro with a focus on one-to-one -one engagement with the hedge fund manager, Craig Shapiro, economics advisor, Jeffrey Fouvry, and direct access to LaDuke Trading founder, Samantha LaDuke. For more information about Edge, visit www.laduketrading.com slash edge. Hey, greetings. Thank you for joining us for Macro to Micro Power Hour. I'm Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDukeTrading.com, joined by our macro advisor, edge manager, Craig Shapiro. Uh, this is also open to Q&A, so we'll, of course, give a little assessment on the macro, get into some of the granularity about uh, why the market's doing what it's doing and what we expect moving forward, but also happy to take your questions for the next hour um, across all assets. So, Let's kick it off uh, right now. I know, Craig, you're looking at Netflix after hours, but uh, I'm reporting after hours today, which is a big sentiment tell for, for the NASDAQ. Stuff is in distribution. Not sure Netflix is going to save us. Give us a, a review. Yeah, agreed. I mean, not necessarily <laughs> a name that I would normally follow, but it's kind of the first of the you know techie names to, to report, looks like. Stocks up a scratch after hours. It was down during the day. So, I mean, who knows? It doesn't seem like it's it's much of, of anything in either direction. I mean, tomorrow is expiry. So um, I think that's probably been helping to keep markets uh, afloat and better than I would have thought, um, given the moves in yields and given the moves in dollar that we've been seeing. And so I think, uh, you know, SPY 500, which is basically right where we closed, um, right where we are now, it seems like a fairly sticky, a big open interest level. So and kind of bounced uh, right around the lows, of, you know, right around there yesterday at the lows and today a few times. So I don't know, it seems like we're maybe having a little trouble getting through that until tomorrow. Uh, but look, I mean, I, I mentioned this in uh, streams in, in, our, in our Slack channel, uh, throughout the course of the last few days, and then on on Twitter as well, that I, I thought there was some striking similarities between the setup today and into the the end of April, like there were uh, in the middle of October of last year, mm. where we had you know a, a move higher in yields, some you know increasing concerns about U.S. fiscal deficits and Treasury supply auctions, and we also had uh, heightened geopolitical issues um, with oil prices firm. And you know we've had yields moving higher. We've had the dollar rallying. Dollar yen's been making new highs every day. Uh, dollar CNH has been moving higher. Dollar against every emerging market across in Asia has been making highs. You know, felt like um, there was a chance that we would have, and still, still do, think that we could have a fairly sizable correction between now and, let's say, the end of the month uh, into Yellen's QRA announcement on uh, April 29th and, and May 1st, which I think will be a very, uh, you know, important market, potential market pivot point. So we can talk a lot more about that. But from here, it just seems like dollar up, yields up, oil up, uh, Fed removing the rate cuts and stock market kind of in a blackout period here for buybacks with CTAs long and vol control funds long and systematic flows long. You're, you're putting the options uh, expiry behind us. The window of weakness is open. And if earnings don't come through, then I, I think hmm. markets are, are really in, in a very vulnerable spot here for the next uh, you know one to two weeks. You got a lot of big tech earnings next week. Obviously, people will be very keen in on Microsoft, Google, Amazon, which I think are all next week. Um, Apple's a week after, and you know Nvidia's a, a, in, in three weeks. They're the later reporter. So um, you know, but but look, it's it's just it seems like a fairly dicey setup here, and really driven by by yield. And we've had a sizable move in the bond market over the course of the last uh, several weeks, as the data has continued to outperform. The inflation data has come in hotter than expected, continuously. Uh, throughout the start of the year, something that you know we've been pressing on and talking about for a while now, you know the impact of loosening financial conditions on the real economy is is showing up, and so uh, the Fed has slowly but surely uh, dragged, kicking and screaming to remove cuts. You know, talk about tighter for longer, higher for longer, and you know even Powell this week. I mean, I think he you know went a long way to to you know changing the narrative and setting the tone as the Fed moves into blackout period starting Saturday, which is one of, it, we're going to be here a while. Um, you know, and and I think as you think about the calendar, the Fed can, if the Fed is not cutting rates in June, which right now it looks like it will not be able to, it just becomes increasingly difficult for them to, to kick off a rate cutting cycle as we push through the rest of the year, because the July meeting 
takes place between the conventions and the September meeting and the November meeting are just so close to the election that unless we have a very significant deterioration in the labor market between now and then, all of those decisions, all of those uh, meetings will be seen as, um, you know, if they decide to cut, they'd be seen as very political. Mm. Um, and I think what we've heard also from the Hawks reiterated this week, Bostic today, um, you know, we will not be cutting, you know, at or, until the end of the year. I mean, he's pushing out to the end of the year. end of the year is December, right? There's six more meetings and he's saying it won't be happened to the last one. He's a voter. Uh, Bowman is the most hawkish member of the Fed. She's a voter. She's not voting for a cut. So, and I don't think Powell commence a rate cutting cycle with dissenting votes. This Fed chair has had one dissenting vote in any meeting since COVID started. He, he's a consensus builder. He's not going to be uh, initiating a cutting cycle with dissenting votes. So until, you know, we start to see that, that real deterioration in the labor market, I, I don't see how the Fed's going to be cutting. So the market is starting to push that through. And I think that's why we're, we're struggling here. Uh, inequities as, as uh, you know, we start to price that that reality in. Yeah, we actually have um, finally broken the uh, 10th longest winning streak in markets since 1950. And it really, really started on April 4th. We had that intraday 2% uh, pullback. Ironically, I had just written about it the day before. We really need to have some washing out of these uh, of these last in, you know, um, bulls to kind of shake the market out of complacency. And it literally was Thursday the 4th. I'm not sure what macro events were transpiring, but we definitely had a, a negative 2.07% intraday FPX pullback. We bounced, of course, but then underneath the surface, we just were, we were selling. The breath was breaking down, the net selling swamped the buying, and then the markets caught down. So we, we definitely have had a, a, a pullback, what is it, a thousand points and uh, dime and, and Dow, and then of course about four and a half, five percent in SPY, two percent of which was this week. And some are kind of giving a lot of um, credence to the um, escalation over in the Middle East, but this, for most part, um, had already kind of uh, started to shake itself out when gold started moving higher in March, March first. Nasdaq went sideways, and now we're just falling over after this distribution period. And that's what happens. Tops are a process, bottoms are an event. So when you look at kind of the the the, the model that you have built to um, track the Fed, what they are doing, you know, and saying versus what they really will ultimately do, their motivations, you have been on top of this. There's no consensus for a cut. Now the market's starting to price that out. Uh, what is what are the chances realistically that they would? Height. Yeah, I mean, I've been saying for a while now that the the asymmetric nature of monetary policy has been part of the reason that the last mile on inflation has been so difficult to achieve because the Fed has basically said the bar to cut low and the bar to raise is high. And so the market has kind of taken that as well, you know, the Fed's eventually going to give us what we want, which is cuts. And so let's let's front run that. Uh, animal spirits have taken off. Inflation expectations have moved higher. Commodity prices have moved higher. Uh, and financial conditions now, uh, you know, really up until this week, are as loose as they've been, you know, since the tightening cycle began in early 2022. So you basically had the Fed created this, this monster of asymmetry where they weren't going to hike. And so now they're in a position where, I think they need to introduce a, a more two-sided, balanced approach to monetary policy in order to kind of bring this to its conclusion. They need to be willing to say, well, we're just as easily going to hike as we are to cut. Now, ultimately, I think just doing that is going to, and, and we're starting to see that already, but you know, suggesting that will will you know remind the market that we're going to be at these at these high levels of, of Fed funds rates really for the rest of the year. Um, and there are going to be no cuts until December. And so you kind of put that in your model and you say, OK, well, that's another eight months of these high rates. And that means we're starting at a higher point for 2025. And I need to start adjusting my outlook for growth, my outlook for earnings, my outlook for inflation, et cetera. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're moving there again. But ultimately, I think and I think that process will make it so we have an asset price correction that ultimately means the Fed will not have to raise rates. Um, so I think we're going to be going through that process here. But but look, I mean, to the extent that, you know, we don't we don't really sell off or if we sell off a little bit between now and and, and next uh, next week and then Yellen comes out the QRA and, and lowers duration supply and we rip higher again, uh, then inflation expectations will rise. The dollar will weaken. Commodities will, will go through the roof. And.
and yeah, the, the Fed will be talking about, you know, June dot plot, there'll be some hikes in there, right? Well, you could imagine the dots will really move up in that in that case. So I, I don't think they're going to hike, but I think they need to start talking more like they'd be willing to do it. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's it's kind of a weird setup, but um, but I think the market is starting to, to to realize that now. We're now only pricing in, you know, one and a half cuts for this year and and really only four cuts through the end of 2025. So we've, we've taken a lot out, um, which is good because we need to, right? We need mm. to have higher rates in order to kind of bring down inflation. Now, look, look I, I, and I've said this before as well, but I mean, there is another path here. It's just the Fed has chosen not to not to take it. The other path would be to be more aggressive with the balance sheet, right? If the Fed would actually engage in true quantitative tightening, selling of assets, reducing the balance sheet faster, not discussing tapering, you know, uh, continuing to sell mortgage-backed securities, uh, maybe do some, you know, this reverse twist that they talked about, which would, means that they'll be selling in the back end. They would be introducing term premium. They would be helping to steepen the yield curve. They would be tightening financial conditions. Uh, and they would be slowing animal spirits. And they'd be tempering inflation expectations. And they'd be bringing down inflation. That would be a better plan. They mm -hmm. should have been doing this the whole time. They decided for whatever reason. Because uh, it benefits pump. Wall Street. <laughs> well, look, I think they what they originally just said that like this is too difficult for the public to understand. Everybody understands rate hikes that always, you know, uh, impact the economy and can slow the economy down and can uh, and can bring inflation down. So that's, that's the tool we're going to use. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to use this other balance sheet, this other tool we have, this balance sheet tool. It's going to operate in the background. It's going to be static. It's going to be like watching paint dry. And it was an, it's an enormous mistake. Mm -hmm. And they're still making the mistake. So they, because they, they're, they're still talking about, you know, interest rate policy as the only uh, tool that they have. So that's the reality. Trade the Fed we have, not the Fed we want. The Fed still thinks that they could raise rates to bring down inflation, even though it's been clear that raising rates has actually been accommodative, given locked in mortgages and locked in corporate borrowings, that the government deficits at high interest rates has been a, a boon to a good chunk of the uh, of the public who has money in the bank that could spend and real wages Ooh. are high. So, so, that, so, so they've been self-defeating. Boomers but, have had a generational wealth increase since COVID because of higher interest rates. I mean, they have and asset prices and housing. So, yeah, there have been some pockets of great wealth accumulation that are helping that yeah. growth. So th this is why we can't bring it. This is why we're not getting inflation back down. This is why it's going to be an election issue um, and, you know, has has potentially adverse impacts on Biden, on Democrats. And I, I just at this point, I don't think. The Democrat, I don't think the Biden administration is going to be able to convince Fed to cut rates before the election, assuming that that is a, you know, something that anybody really thought they were able to do. I, I'm skeptical that they had that, that, that Powell would act in that way anyway. You mean say what he said just two weeks ago, that he's still- Look, I mean, and, 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 and this is not a political commentary, but I don't think no, Biden, but... I, I don't think Biden really has any clue about okay, what the Fed, okay. about what the Fed is doing. Okay, okay, but he did say that they would cut rates before- yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, look, I don't think that was, I, I think that's, you know, that wasn't him getting any new information. That was him just like, you know, under, like doubling down. Him. Yeah, he, he wasn't, yeah. I don't think he was revealing anything new when he made that kind of off the cuff comment uh, answering a question. Um, but look, I think that there, you know, the, the, the administration doesn't have a real ability to influence the Fed at this point. They do have an ability to use the Treasury general account to influence yeah, the election. Talk about they that. do have the ability to, to change the duration supply versus bill supply, if they want to, if they want to be very, that's a much, much more uh, attractive option if you're the Biden administration looking to get reelected is use Treasury's ability to influence uh, the curve and to influence duration supply in order to pump liquidity. I think they may do that. You, but and you that's have a better like, idea than trying to convince the Fed. The Fed's not the Fed's not going to give you what you plus want. Plus, the Fed is still, I believe, you know, the flea on the tail of the dog. So if the dog is spending and barking um, over in Congress and White House and Treasury is really trying to enable and finance all of that, Fed is really so trapped. But um, you you kind of covered the macro as it relates to Fed cuts are getting priced out of the market. That's bearish. Whether or not it starts to price in hikes, you know, that's that's a little bit uh, kind of early in the narrative. But the Treasury, um, the QRA, the quarterly refunding announcement is coming up at the end of this month, which is just right around the corner. And I am uh, I posted um, your write up from your channel about the breakdown of TGA and where that really does push yelling to issue more uh, bonds and notes than bills, which is liquidity sucking versus adding. 
So we're kind of in an air pocket of, of liquidity risk, potentially, if she follows through with the issuance that is uh, longer duration than shorter. So if she does follow through with that, that just exaggerates these downward moves potentially. Um, what happens really if she does the, 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 the short duration route, the market's also going to see this as very much political and even stronger case for, for fiscal dominance. Where are, you, where are you kind of placing your bet? You're gonna clear out by then? And then yeah. reassess after, or are you going to hold through that event? Because there's a yeah. huge event risk right there. Bullish Look, bear it, 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 hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't always been the case where there's been this incessant focus on the QRA, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Brand but... New. But yeah. look, we are in a point, we are in an unprecedented point of having 6% plus deficits as far as the eye can see at 125% debt to GDP with full employment and inflation running above target. And mm -hmm. so it becomes a much, and because of the way that the Fed has put QT into the background, they've kind of transferred the transmission mechanism of monetary policy in the balance sheet to the treasury. And so the treasury basically gets to dictate whether or not QT is working or it's not worked, partly to do with the, the RRP, which was built up and has been subsequently drained, but now it's stabilizing at a low level. It has to do with whether or not they issue more bills versus bonds. And so, and so look, I think going into that event on 429 in the afternoon, uh, which is Monday, we get the total amount of borrowings for the second quarter and a first estimate for the third quarter. So that will be uh, the treasury and we'll get an update on the, the treasury general account ending quarter balances for the second quarter after the third quarter, which should stay at 750 billion. Um, mm. That will give us a read on how tax receipts have been coming in. Early indications were that tax receipts have been coming in a little bit better than expected. I mean, we'll see. We still have to see how the checks clear in the next few days. I mean, um, but you know, the early signs that they, they're running a little bit better than expected. Um, so that may lower the overall needs of Treasury to to borrow in 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 the subsequent months. Um, then on May first is when we get the more important uh, announcement, which is the composition of the issuance of Treasury securities for the next three month period, which is May, mm -hmm. June, July. Right now we have um, February, March, and April. Then we'll get May, June, July, and you typically will also get kind of the next three months of how the Treasury Borrowing Committee is is going to guide uh, for the third quarter. So the borrowing committee that is made up of primarily banks and hedge funds. That's correct. But they but okay. but they've already they've already guided for the second quarter, um, you know, close to 1.1 trillion of gross notes and bonds issuance and about 500 billion of, of net bonds supply. So it's a lot. Now, Janet can make a decision uh, with these better than expected tax receipts and say, you know what, 500 billion of net new supply of coupons uh, seems like a lot because um, because yields are been moving higher and term premiums are now positive. And so you know what, maybe I'm going to cut that back. It would be seen as an incredibly political decision because A, term premiums are basically zero. So there's, mm -hmm. the Fed is incentivized mm -hmm. still, I'm sorry, the Treasury is still incentivized to be borrowing uh, long out the curve since historically term premiums have averaged, you know, close to, you know, between 75 and 100 basis points. And they're still, they're basically zero. So there is incentive for the Treasury to be thinking about borrowing long term. Second, the yield curve is inverted. So the more that they're borrowing up front, the more the, the more expensive it is for the treasury in absolute term. Um, and so, look, I think it, you know it 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 makes. Uh, and then lastly, um, there is a an un, is a written unwritten rule about the composition of bills versus bonds supply. I'm sorry, uh, maturities in the in the treasury's books between 15 and 20 percent should be bills, and the rest should be bonds. Treasury has been operating above that 20 percent limit now for the last several months. And mm -hmm. will continue to do so. And so again, they're supposed to issue less bills and issue more bonds. Now, Yellen can make a decision like she did in November to basically say, eh, you know what? I don't know. Uh, I, I'd like to do less. And she she has that in her in her right. And she can say, Let, this is all the market can bear. Treasury borrowing committee is telling me that you know the liquidity out the curve isn't as good. Maybe I'll maybe I'll reduce some of the 30s and 10s and 20s. And if she did that you know, ter term premiums would fall and yields in the back would probably fall again because uh, there'd be less supply. And so, um, you know, that has the ability to kind of reignite, um, you know, this risk on trade again, which is what mm -hmm. we saw mm -hmm. in, in November and December. So yeah, for me, 
I think the trade is to kind of stick with this risk off construct between now and then, and then wait to decide what to see what she says and then but react the, accordingly. But there's a big difference between the November uh, 1st Fed pause and Yellen Yahtzee. Right now it's the reverse. Their Fed pause is around pausing cuts <laughs> and the uh, huge short interest that we had built up in the markets from that August first QRA where she had a lot more um, longer duration um, bonds than the November 1st, a lot more shorter duration bills. So between August and August 1st and November 1st, the market, um, you know, it went lower, not quickly, uh, but shorts had build, built up tremendously. So that really was the fire that ignited um, on short covering, followed up with that November 14th CPI print, which was also, you know, it, you know, igniting, if you will, the, um, uh, the fact that cut, that, that, that Fed would pause and actually move to cuts. Yeah. So very different backdrop. Yeah, yeah. November for, 1st. For, right for now sure. we have the opposite. We've got we've got the CTAs, uh, which we talked about um, every week, obviously with clients, but they're still selling at every opportunity, whether the the week is plus neutral or minus. So they're selling into this QRA event because their technical levels have been hit. Um, and there isn't a build up of build up of shorts at all. So we we actually don't have the fuel for igniting a massive short covering rally. I, it, that's the only caveat I would put in there. We definitely. Yeah, I mean, we'll see where we are by the time we get yeah. there in ten days. <laughs> but but because um, yeah. I I think we could have a five plus percent correction between now and, and the next you know in the next week or so on back on back of this. Um, and, and as um as it, I'm looking at the tape right now, Kashkari just said we can wait as long as it takes before cutting rates. Could potentially wait until 2025 to lower rates. Right. So we're we're getting more speed pushback pushback. Yeah. But look, I I agree with you that the setup in today is is different than the setup back then it's actually it's actually worse because back then the data was starting to to roll over the fed actually in in the november beige book talked about a, an economy that was really slowing it had already seen three months in a row of worse than expected meaning lower than expected in inflation print. So there was there was some reason why the Fed was thinking about removing that last rate hike. Right mm -hmm. now, it's mm -hmm. the opposite. You have the economy is fine. The data is improving. Um, even the manufacturing PMI is above 50. And the inflation data now is three months in a row positive. And then next month is again going to be positive. I mean, all indications are from Cleveland Fed inflation forecast that, you know, the April inflation print is going to be hot again, particularly given what gasoline has been doing. So yeah, you have a very different setup. So it's, I think most likely what is going to happen is we are going to get to the yelling point. She is going to kind of deliver a, a, a neutral message with, you know, a, a lot of bonds, um, but maybe not more than expected, but, you know, let's say another 500 billion of supply. And then the Fed's going to come out at the May meeting that afternoon and basically say, yeah, we're hawkish. And so I think then we will get a continuation of the risk off situation that um, that we are are seeing where with with bonds down and stocks down. But I am particularly concerned that we may front run all of this over the course mm. of the next seven to 10 trading days, because what is going to stop this now? Now, look, we got big tech earnings next week, next week, right? That will mm -hmm. be huge because no matter what anybody says, Microsoft and Google and Amazon put up big numbers. The Nasdaq's going to rally, right? There's enough people still who just look at stocks, who don't look at macro, who don't look at cross cross asset correlation, and will say, "I got to own these big tech names. They're blowing the doors out on numbers. You know, get me in." And that 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 could keep us afloat. But if one of those names, you know, misses, um, we could really be into a lot of trouble before this QRA. So that's how no, I, I've I've been I've been playing it with IWM because. And I've been showing this chart. And I'm you know, short spy and cues and semis. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, but I think IWMs are are much more exposed to higher rates and higher oh, energy sure. and higher inflation. So um, so I I, I kind of don't necessarily need to deal with the saga of this big tech AI madness because it, look, I mean, the truth of the matter is AI has become a bit more of an idiosyncratic story. It's made NASDAQ less of a macro asset to trade. It's 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 being it's trading on 
kind of a different fundamental thing, which kind of lowers the lowers the sharp ratio of trading it. You can't like look at cross every cross asset signal and say, I'm going to trade NASDAQ off that anymore because there is a structural story that are enamoring people that's enamoring people uh, with respect to AI. So I, I, I prefer sticking with SPY or with IWM or some of the overseas ETFs that um, are obviously less uh, exposed to AI and maybe have a dollar. Well, uh, just looking at the charts, we're definitely a very, very different place than... Um back in November from another perspective as well. But if we were to retrace even to the breakout in, you know, in December, where we started obviously, you know, breaking out of that uh, prior 2023 high, we're still 10% away. I mean, we could have quite, I don't think that's going to yeah. happen in two weeks, well, but um, we can get there if she does not uh, feed the market yeah. um, what they want. And right now it's clearly getting that sense. So we've we've kind of you reviewed the Fed um, trapped uh, situation, which traps some bulls. Obviously, the CTAs selling nonstop until they're uh, you know satisfied. The technical breakdown, the Treasury. Uh, I don't know what you even call this. It just seems like she's really going to be in a pickle. Um, if whether she moves forward one way or the other, she's it, it's going to be a tough. That's going to be a tough call. She really thought we were going to be in a much better better situation for inflation and Fed cuts uh, before this uh, April QRA, it feels. So yeah. there's I, a lot Look, I think they made a calculation uh, last fall and into the early part of this year that they had done enough to kind of bring inflation back down to 2% and that they could start a cutting cycle that would keep the economy running hot and afloat throughout the entirety of 2024, which would assist, you know, the the, the re-election campaign of Biden. Um, and and again, you know, keep people employed and, and that would be that would be great. And what they failed to realize is that in a highly financialized economy, the, the dramatic loosening of financial conditions that was allowed to take place by the combination of the the Yellen pivot and the treasure and the Fed's dovishness kind of you know brought in a significant loosening of financial conditions that reignited animal spirits, inflation expectations, and actual inflation through the wealth effect. And so we that they made it more difficult to achieve the last mile. And inflation has now come back in a way that is frightening to the administration and to the Fed that does not want this to be an election issue. I mean, the worst mm -hmm. thing for Democrats is for people to be complaining about high gasoline prices, high energy, high inflation in the run up to November. So they 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 missed and their time. They missed their time. Affordability and car auto. They tried. Look, they tried to run it hot, and there was a chance that they could do it, and they went for it, and I think they missed. And so now they are they are scrambling to try to to fix this. Um, and so the Fed is kind of, the, the rhetoric from the Fed is moving um, as rapidly as like the Fed would allow it to move, right? You you know, you went from, uh, you know, the, the, the March meeting, which was only, I don't know, what was a month ago? Yes, you know, we, we still expect to cut three times to Powell saying a month later after seeing the March print, yeah, I'm not so sure. Like we we're like we need a lot longer to go, and, and a bunch of other Fed have, members now have pushed out the, the timeline. So the Fed is actually moving fast for the, the Treasury Fed. is too. I mean, Yellen's already been to China. <laughs> She's very active right now at the IMF, probably um, looking for some assists here on the bond buying. Uh, can we talk a little bit about um, the emerging market because um, backdrop and um, China and Japan because this. Uh, wrecking ball of a U.S. dollar, which is, you know, strong relative to other currencies, very weak uh, relative to hard assets um, and commodities, is still uh, an issue, glaring issue with a 10-year yield, with um, the, the dollar yen pushing up to 155 when they swore they would come in and intervene at 152. They're kind of losing control here. What's, what's that look like? Because it doesn't look bullish right now, unless they as as we saw, I think yesterday, um, you know, in talks uh, at IMF with uh, Japan and Korea because of the outsized uh, weakness in the yen and the, and the yuan. Where's where's this where's this headed? Yeah, look, I mean, dollar wrecking ball is is 
taking uh kicking ass and taking names for, mm -hmm. for lack of a a, a better uh analogy and you know what we have is a a situation where you know the the dollar is rallying against other fiat currencies because of growth and yield differentials which is making it uh you know more expensive in in Japan and in Korea right their their currencies are you know, have been weakening China as well. Look, as far as the yen is concerned, the BOJ has to decide whether or not they want higher yields or they want a stronger yen. Mm -hmm. um, and my view is that close to, you know, and north of 250% debt to GDP, Japan has no tolerance for much higher yields. It will bankrupt the, it'll bankrupt the BOJ, it'll bankrupt the banks in Japan. And so they will only gradually allow yields to rise which means that the currency is the outlet, right? As Japan's economy slows, uh, they have no other uh, other choice. They're going to keep yields low and the rest of the world's going to have higher yields, particularly in the US. Dollar yen is going to go much higher. Now they mm -hmm. can jawbone, they can complain, they can do whatever they want, but I don't really think they actually care to strengthen the yen. There's really no downside to having a weaker yen at this point. Now, if it, if energy starts to rip on them um, and then they start to import more inflation, then they have an issue. And so what I think they would do in that scenario is they'd sell US treasuries to slow mm -hmm. down the pace of yen weakness. But, you know, it, it's it's not, it, it, they are competing against China. China has a weakened currency. Uh, the export markets are competitive. And I think there's a bit of a competitive devaluation going on in, in Asia. So um, nobody wants a, a too strong of a currency. And yes, they're complaining about their currencies being too weak right now. But really, what's what's the problem? You know, I don't see why they're having such a, a you know, an issue. And so I don't think we're going to see uh, any any intervention in, in any particularly you know robust way here, particularly while the U.S. is doing what it's doing, which is growing above trend, inflation above trend, and a Fed that's going to be tighter for longer. Like, what would be the point of trying to fight uh, the Fed if you're if you're the BOJ or the MOF right now? I don't I don't see the point. So I think you're going to continue to have dollar strength, um, and you know that that's typically not a great setup for you know for risk either. No, especially with um higher yields. And you know, I have a very key level of this four point six eight eight, which ironically tapped and then came back down, and above that. My rate of change indicator says it picks up some speed. So we got to be aware of that because I still thought that was going to be further down the road. It's picked up speed way pulled forward um, with this equity correction. Uh, Dean mentions um, Powell's afraid of another Q4 2018 correction, most likely. Fed stopped QT right after that. That's, you know, what do you think the chances are of uh, them coming out on the first saying, yeah, we're going to taper that QT. Um, and then would the market really respond that much to it? I, I think they're more um, hankering for good news from Yellen. Look, back in 4Q18, um, the, you know, there, there was a lot going on. But for, for one thing, though, that was equities were down 20% from the highs. We're, we're not even down. So I know, I know. So I, know. So, that, so I think that, look, there is always going to be a Fed put. There is always going to be a Treasury put. There is always going to be an ECB put, BOJ put, uh, a political put, they're, it's, it's, they're everywhere. And so the question is, what are the strikes, right? Where do those puts get struck? And my view is when inflation is running hotter than expected and above target, the puts get struck at lower prices than I think they that, that I think the market is used to. Now, people will look back and say, well, look what happened last March with, with the SVB situation and look how quickly the Fed came that. in. And, yeah. and and they and they wouldn't be wrong, but I think it is important to to understand that the Fed has put in facilities place now to, and has given banks time to kind of work through that. And so I don't think the Fed's reaction would be as swift this time to you know some regional banks you know having issues. I mean, and plus these regional banks are fifty percent off the load. So again, the, the put the Fed put to provide liquidity back into this market and this economy is just way lower than 5,000 on the S&P. Talk to me when we're down at 4,000. And then, and then I'll, I'll, be tell, I'll be telling you, yeah, the Fed's going to the Fed's gonna do something. But I just don't think with, with credit spreads as tight as, as they are, with stocks basically at the highs, with a dollar firm, with treasury auctions going fine, uh, you know, a little bit weak, but fine. Um, term they premiums, two botched ones, but, yes. but 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 nothing, but nothing to to go crazy about. And term premiums are still, you know, basically Correct. zero. 
and the yield curve is, you know, not not disruptive. So I just don't think that there we're in a a pain point for for these folks now. Not yet, but being not yet. But I think I think we will get there, and I think yeah. the market will search for the pain, right? And when we get through levels that are perceived pain points. And the and the the Fed or the the political party the political uh, group doesn't act, then we will slice rapidly to find the next point. That's typically how this plays out. So I think what we're going to find here is a Fed and Treasury that are not receptive to fear, and we are going to slice through these put levels uh, to find the, the next strikes, and I think they're going to be you know way lower. Um, you know, the course of the coming weeks. Let me show you this uh, or like explain why I have this uh, chart up of high yield OAS, which is basically credit spreads have been really, really, really not a concern. So tight. Um, a April 10th, I said, I think they're done going down. And there was an interview that Dean is highlighting by uh, of Matt Maley of uh, Miller Tabak, chief market strategist. And he said, Fed didn't care about stock market mid-December 2018 until the junk bo bond market imploded. That's when they pivoted. Fed cares about fixed income market. So uh, we're, we're, we're definitely just coming up off the bottom from very, very tight. Uh, we, we definitely are just starting to correct in equities um, and everything will change once yields really start to move aggressively higher. But for right now, you're right. They are they are still selling under the surface. There is no intervention by Fed, you know, for the next week and a half, most likely. Um, so it's going to be very kind of uh, nerve wracking. I think a week and a half for bulls. They're really hoping that earnings will delight. I think they're going to disappoint. I think the bar is just. Um, it, they had an easy 2023. I think the bar is kind of high. Look, I think we're in again. I think we're we're in a in a situation here where the markets are a little bit on edge. And people are looking for the Fed or the Treasury to bail them out <laughs> again. And my, my point is those bailout points come at lower levels when inflation still. And I think that's where we are. I mean, and so I just don't anticipate any speedy liquidity additions from the Fed uh, any, you know, here until we get a, a, a significant deterioration in the labor market, which all signs are is not is not here at this point. And so, did you see Jim Bianco's um, tweet this morning or last night where he's like, how is it every single week for jobless claims, it registers yeah. 212,000, 212,000. It, it, it hasn't changed except for two weeks. So, you know, calling into question the, the validity of that report, we already have many, many reasons to be suspect of the BLS um, and and inflation. But generally speaking, it's been a really good backdrop for bulls until March 1st, when gold shot up like a rocket, NASDAQ stopped moving higher, stuff stopped getting so um, supportive. And now this distributive top is actually showing um, it, what we already saw under the surface, net selling, breath breakdown, US dollar, uh, U, um, USD JPY spiking above uh, 152, 10 year yield spiking above 4.3. The dollar is now firmly, you know, above 105, it's 106. So yeah. right now with gold, um, silver kind of holding their own and the options market getting a little nervous, OPEX is tomorrow. We've got the end of month um, drama with uh, FOMC and Treasury. Uh, what is your, uh, you know, bullish argument? What really could help support this right now? What I see as we've talked about danger zone and an air pocket of risk. What could yeah. be bullish? Well, let me just let me just share my screen here real quick because I want to I wanted to show you why I'm so concerned about the timing and then that that'll kind of translate into how this can uh, get rectified. But go ahead. Um, hold on. So. Part of what I've been talking about uh, for for this week is that we there is a massive liquidity drain that's been going on, and the reason that there's a massive liquidity drain, uh, can you see that chart? Yep. Okay, so this is this is bank reserves, right? So this is a three hundred billion decline in bank reserves week on week. Why? Because tax payments, right? And I've been talking about this. April fifteenth was a massive, you know, tax payment week. Um, everybody pays their taxes, and so what winds up happening is the money needs to get paid from somewhere. It can either get paid from the reverse repo facility or it can get paid from bank reserves. And my view was that this was going to get paid out of bank reserves uh, because yields and the RRP are actually still you know, reasonably good. And so what we had was the RRP has, has built back up from Monday by 
a hundred or so billion, right? You tell me you can't start. Is this the art? Yeah. yeah. So actually, you can't even really hold on a second. Sorry. Right. Uh, it's weird. It doesn't even show on the chart. On the 15th, we were down at 327 billion for this uh, facility. I guess it's just, okay, here we go. Sorry. So this was tax day, right? The big payment down. And then this is the quick rebuild uh, over the course of the last uh, two days because the yields in the RRP are 5.3%. They're just superior to uh, investing money in bills or keeping money in the bank where you don't earn uh, much in the way of interest. And so this is where bank reserves are uh, as of the end of the day yesterday, right? So you have a 300 billion decline in bank reserves. This has been part of the reason why I've been so concerned is that you have a massive liquidity drain that has been going on. If you think about where that money's going, it's going here, right? It's going into the TGA. Mm -hmm. So the TGA, the Treasury's general account is the Treasury's checking account built by 300, by 250 billion. And this is probably going to kind of peak out in the middle of next week at like 950 billion. So call it a nearly $300 billion increase in the Treasury's general account. Now, this is going to get spent back down, right? And so this is where you start to think about um, a bullish scenario, right? Yellen's ability to put money back into the economy. So eventually, this but money- that's so inflationary. <laughs> but this money, but look, we still have, to, I guess my point is, we still have to trade the deflationary part or the risk off part of the drain, right? If mm -hmm. I look at like, look at this, this is the, and I've shown this chart before and a lot of people don't, don't like it, but this is bank reserves- versus S&P, right? Mm -hmm, mm. I mean, like the correlation is pretty good, right? Like it's a pretty good correlation. You know, there's a reasonably tight correlation between like money in the banks that are available to be spent into the, into the financial markets and like how well the stock market is doing. Well, we just dumped $300 billion, you know, off that high. I mean, obviously this would intonate, you know, if this if the correlation here was good, you know, an S&P back down below 4,600. Again, not necessarily calling for that in the next uh, week or so, but mm -mm, th th mm -mm. this this number is not going to rapidly rise back up. It is going to rise up gradually over the course of the next 10 weeks as Treasury issues less bills. So that is the dynamic by which the Treasury puts money back into the economy. It's they spend money out and they retire bills. Uh, and that, that's what they talked about, a negative net bills issuance. And so this number from the TGA um, will go back to 750 billion by the end of June. And so we will go back, you know, we'll put this that from the 950 to 750. And if Yellen decides, hey, you know what, we actually only need 700 or 600, you know, maybe there'll be more, maybe they'll be, she'll be providing more liquidity. But right now, the issue is a significant liquidity drain that continues for the next one to two weeks into the end of the quarter. That's why I think we are in such a precarious situation here uh, for the next, you know, call it seven to 10 trading days. The other thing, which I think is very interesting, which just also just came out, is we've been talking about a lack of foreign demand for treasuries, right? Because the mm -hmm. government is is profligate in spending and there's no hope of um, ever paying back the deficits. We expropriate reserves of our enemies. And so um, why should we uh, foreigner buy uh, US treasuries? Well, Lo and behold, what do we have now? All-time record high of primary dealer holdings of treasuries, right? So basically, the banks are being forced to buy and hold treasuries. This is a, a record all-time high over $300 billion. On bank. And so, so these banks are- actually referred to as bond stuffing. Right. So, so banks are being forced to hold these. Now, look, they don't have to- um, hold reserves, you know, it, it, you know, risk weighted. This is not such a, a big deal. And look, eventually we get this SLR exemption and it'll be zero weighting. But for now, like, it's, it's not so uh, disadvantageous for primary dealers, but on the margin it is. And on the margin, it's sucking liquidity out of the system that primary dealers are being forced into buying more and more of the treasury supply. Foreigners are taking less and less Mm -hmm. There's just one more chart. It's a little bit stale, the data, because we only get it with two months lag. This is China's holdings of U.S. Treasuries. And so, you know, basically, after yeah. kind of a little bit of a reprieve in the San Francisco Accord last last uh, November, boom, yeah. right back down again. And I suspect in March and into April, we're making new lows here. China is net selling Treasuries. They continue to sell Treasuries. My sense is they want to have no Treasuries, just like Russia 
um, you know, as, as quickly as possible, particularly if they're thinking of making a move on Taiwan. I have no idea if that's something that they're going to do, but uh, it would make more sense for them to own less treasuries that could be sanctioned or expropriated. So expect China to continue to be selling treasuries, and that will make it much more difficult for the treasury to finance itself at attractive rates. And so I think we are going to be in a situation where yields out the curve continue to move higher. Uh, and I know you, you've been targeting a six and a half percent 10 year, uh, it, you know, makes makes a lot of sense to me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not buying 10 years until, you know, we have six handles or maybe higher. So well, um, Jamie Diamond says 8%. So well, I'm way, way light. And by the way, that's actually worrisome, right? I mean, think about 8%. I, I'm not thinking about 8%, but he is. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't look, I um, mean, and I, and I think what we have is we, we have we have pushed the Overton window here on on acceptability of the U.S. government's financing itself. It's it's the common knowledge issue. Whereas like people like Jamie Dimon, I saw the Goldman CEO today talking about these fiscal deficits and the issue of government financing. And so this is becoming, you know, I, I had a conversation on Twitter uh, with Stephen Moran, who mm -hmm. doesn't like the word, doesn't like the use of the term fiscal dominance. No, I saw that. And, 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 and I think he's right. I think he's right. And because there is something the Fed could do if they want it. It's just that they choose not to. So he's right. It's not necessarily fiscal dominance. dominance. It's fiscal primacy, right? They are, pri they, they are, they are focusing, they, they are not um, being hawkish enough, they are not allowing bond vigilantes to do what they do because they are more they are focused on fisc on the fiscal situation of the country. They they could do something. So we are not in dominance yet um, because in, in when we were in dominance, there was literally nothing the central bank could do. There are things that our central bank could do. They just choose not to um, for a variety of reasons. And so I, I know we've kind of, you know, maybe parsing words, some semantics there. But um, re regardless, the Fed is not, the Fed has elevated the smooth uh, treasury market functioning as their primary responsibility. And so that is why they are not as hawkish as they should be. Uh, they are allowing the government to continue to finance itself. But I think that more market participants are waking up to this reality, which is why bond yields are moving higher, which is why gold is moving higher, which is why inflation expectations are moving higher. Like the, the people get it. The government's never going to pay back the debts in anything other than deflated currency. And so you need to figure out how to maintain purchasing power of your wealth. And the historical ways you do that are gold, commodities, and those are much better ballasts to a portfolio than bonds. Bonds are certificates of confiscation. They do not provide any hedging abilities. They are just amplifying your equity risk. A 60-40 portfolio is basically a 100% equity portfolio. There is no hedge. If you want to hedge equities, you hedge them with commodities, uh, you hedge them with inflation protection securities. Bonds are not the, are, 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 or sovereign bonds are not the answer. And so I think we are moving into that regi new regime it's been in place now probably for 18 months, maybe two years, you know, since Russia attacked Ukraine. And we've gone into a new kind of more structural and cyclical inflationary world. And, you know, bonds are just not going to retain their value. And I think we are going to be in a position where we make higher highs and higher lows and government yields uh, until we have, you know, a much bigger, uh, a, a much bigger crisis. All right, then. <laughs> well, that's yeah. cheery. I know that give us a, I asked you for the bull case, by the way, but so the bull, the bull, the bull case is, I guess is, is tactical, right? The bull case yeah, is, it is. It is that it's um, we are going to be in, in a position here where we have a little bit of risk off and ultimately uh, there's another kick the can type um, construct created whereby Yellen uh, decides to give us a little bit of and less in the way of treasury duration. She decides to run down the TGA a little more aggressively mm -hmm. over the course of the next three to six months. Um, the Fed is on hold, but, you know, is not, is, is basically continues to push back against hikes. They just will say, look, there's, we're just, eventually it's going to work. Eventually it's going to work. They never, you know, talk about hikes and, you know, the, the, the economy just kind of continues to, to operate and does well. And so earnings hold in and and we're fine and somehow that happens without a breakout in oil and so inflation expectations don't really rip you know further from here I, again i think we're, i think we're threading the needle but we could have a we could have a world peace type event look if saudi makes a deal with israel for which is being pushed now and somehow iran says okay we're going to we're we're cool for now and then oil falls 
and gasoline falls and then you know all of a sudden there is know, a lot of risk premium in yeah. oil price and yeah. it is so that, starting that, to come down interestingly on rumors that there might be an armistice signed or somehow negotiated between ukraine and russia not geopolitical expert here not even a little but i do follow uh pippa malgram very closely and this is something that is has been discussed it's a no win for either side um but at least it you know it does slow down the, the, the spending um, yeah. that have been throwing money over there. And it helps, you know, remove that distraction from the Biden election. But long story short, that is, like you said, that is a bullish backdrop um, with war ending. Yes, for sure. And it's very bullish, the dollar in another sense, right? Right now we have it being pressured lower um, through fiscal dominance, no question, commodities higher. Um, and this is why we're kind of waiting for the rate uh, spike to really take off because the spending hasn't gotten under control. And that wouldn't probably take place until we get a new sheriff in town. Um, and that whole, you know, story is, um, I, I mean, a different sheriff than the ones we already know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, so we, we really don't have uh, anything um, going on right now that's bullish in the short term before QRA. Long story short, individual stock reports, um, you're kind of getting asked about Apple but uh, they're still, no, they're not holding their support. Neither is Tesla. Um, we'll have to wait through earnings uh, on NVIDIA since there's such a big sentiment tell. But big picture, um, lots of questions about banks always, uh, it, not only in this webinar that we do, but in general, because they're such a big, solid um, economic driver of loans and credit expansion, and they're just not. Um, and Greg uh, Jeffrey has worked on an FDIC review on their quarterly and said, no, they're actually they're they're petering out and about to ro roll over from their net interest margins, from their uh, loans. They're just not in a really great place, actually. But the price looks great um, on the screen. So there's a lot of stuff right now that is still very overbought um, and hasn't broken. Uh, some sectors are absolutely uh, breaking. So uh, careful on on. The, the semi love, it might have gone a little bit too far too fast. Um, any final thoughts on macro event risk coming up? We know PCE is uh, a big one next week. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about economic data before we get to FOMC and uh, QRA. Yeah, look, next week we are in uh, Fed quiet period, thankfully. Um, <laughs> uh, but we have, uh, you know, we have some kind of B rated uh, data next week flash PMI, new home sales, some regional PMIs. And then, yeah, on Friday, we'll get um, the, the the PCE or PCE, which has been a, a figure that is uh, well modeled out, right? When you have mm -hmm. the CPI and the PPI already in hand, uh, the confidence interval on the core PCE becomes, you know, pretty low. People kind of get where this is going to come in. And so the estimates I've been seeing are in the 0 0.28, 0 0.29 camp uh, month on month for core PCE which is a level that is above getting to um that's you know above getting to 2.6% 2, 2. by the end of the year but the fed uh even this week uh Jefferson and a couple others had said you know they expect the, that number to come in at like 2.8% for core year on year so we kind of know the number so i don't think it's going to be um much of a much of a surprise. Um, what we do also get next Friday is a final reading on University of Michigan inflation expectations, which are above 3%. And so if that remains above 3%, um, again, it just shows you that inflation expectations are at risk of becoming unanchored if gasoline prices and inflation continue to move higher. And that just makes it more difficult for, you know, again, the Fed to 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 think about cutting. But quietish, weak macro front, definitely more uh, micro with, I think, uh, Microsoft is on, let's see, Microsoft reports on the 25th after hours, which is uh, Thursday. Amazon is also, no, Amazon's a week after. Google is uh, the 25th as well. And Tesla is the 23rd. So, um, and I think someone asked about Apple. Apple is the week after. That's the the second. That's the day after the Fed. So and some de some decent tech earnings next week. Um, that'll yeah. that'll be the kind of the driver. We're, we're through expiry as of tomorrow at the close, and so um, the window of weakness is is open. Liquidity is. Oh, we have drained. been in a window of weakness, and it yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, the, we have them. And I don't think um, those three big reports, also Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, they have been the three. Um, Netflix, obviously, has been up there, too. Uh, Meta, on, uh, also. Meta reports next week, too. Yeah, and Meta. Okay. 
But those three in particular, they're promising some really big capex, which is fabulous for um, long-term gains, but at the expense of stock buybacks uh, in the short term. So there might be a different dynamic coming into the market uh, this year and next as it relates to fewer buybacks, not more. That's been a huge tailwind for the uh, the, the tech plays. Anyway, yep. we'll see how that plays out. Anyway, we'll be listening for guidance. Again, this is Macro to Micro Power Hour. So we're going to end on that hour, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for attending again, Samantha LaDuke, Craig Shapiro. We wish you a great rest of the trading week. Thank you, Craig. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Subscribe to LaDuke Trading YouTube channel for more macro to micro power hour videos and other content.